Well, good morning. We are glad you've joined us for this 4th of July weekend, and I know that there's a lot of you busy doing all kinds of things with family, and so I appreciate you've taken time to, to stop and to share together with us, centering our lives around what freedom in Christ means, as well as freedom in our country. And uh, we are going to be celebrating, I'm Pastor Paul, by the way, and I'm the campus pastor here in Sutherland, if you don't know who I am. And we are going to be celebrating communion through this service time. And so I would invite you to go right now, put us on pause, and uh, I happen to have some grape juice because I raided the church fridge. Uh, maybe you've got some other kinds of juice, and it's not the point of exactly what kind of juice it is. It's about that this is a remembrance of Christ and what he's done for us. And then I, if you could grab some, a cracker or some bread or something, and if you have that kind of set aside and ready, um, we're going to actually segue just into a communion time, and it makes less distraction if you can stop now and and go get that, and then your hearts will be ready. And right now, we're going to uh, start with a word of prayer, and then we're going to have a couple of songs that will just, I think, take you to a place of believing how good God is and that we need to trust in Him. So let's start with prayer, and then we'll move on to the music. God, thank you for our chance to be here together. Thank you for the country that we are a part of, that in spite of its many problems, that we enjoy the freedom of religion, that we have a freedom to worship. We have a freedom, Lord, to move about as we would like. And this last year has been a, a year with all kinds of difficulties. And thank you, God, for bringing us through that and, and for bringing us to the place where here in Oregon we are not under the mask mandate anymore and many people have already either gotten vaccinated or, or had COVID. And so there's this degree of freedom that we are beginning to experience. And it reminds us how precious freedom is. And so, Father, as we think about what you have done to set us free, as we talk about your heart and about the heart you have for people who are in captivity, I pray that your spirit would be here present and that you would move in our hearts and in our living rooms and wherever we're watching. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's listen to this music, or you can sing along if you'd like. Giants fall, dead men rise, sickness heals.
So we are going to take a look at a very important and very uh, famous piece of scripture. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 4 to start with, and then we will move to Luke chapter 15. Um, If you have your phone or if you have a computer or an iPad, you can probably pull up the outline there and uh, you'll be able to also watch or read the scriptures there. So in Luke chapter 4, there's this cool moment where Jesus is visiting the synagogue and As a Jewish rabbi, he is invited to then read a passage of scripture, and so he is able to read whatever it is he would like to read. And he he picks up the the scroll, and he goes through it. You know, this is not a book that you just flip through. There's a big process of opening a scroll to the right place. And so he intentionally opens it to the book of Isaiah. And and he reads these verses. This is uh, Luke 4.18. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled the scroll back up and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Now that's a very small piece from Isaiah 61. And After that, it goes on and talks about judgment and and the terrible things that were going to happen to Israel, but he just read one little piece of it, and then when everybody's looking at him like, for why did you read that, and maybe why did you read so short, and he said, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. It was Jesus' way of declaring that he's come to set captives free, to declare freedom for those who are in captivity, and we want to talk about how we tend to get in captivity because the scariest thing is when somebody is actually captive, when they are caught, when they are bound and they don't even realize it. They're not even looking to be set free and Jesus has come to set captives free. So if you want to flip over to Luke chapter 15, there's one of the perhaps most famous parables or stories that Jesus told and it's often called the story of the prodigal son which is really uh, a misnamed story. Prodigal actually means incredibly generous or incredibly wasteful, and we could actually call it the story of the prodigal God, or I think maybe a better story title would be the story of two captive brothers. That, that was the theme of setting the captives free. And so let me read the first part of it, which is in Luke chapter 15, and it starts in verse 11. And Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. And not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth in wild living. Now you think, there's somebody that's free. You see, ordinarily, the two sons would have had to wait until their father died, and then they would have divided the property. And the older son was going to get the majority, because he carried on the name and he carried the wealth of the family, so he would get most of it, but there was a portion that the younger son would get. And so the younger son, by saying, I want my money now, was really disrespecting his father. He was kind of saying, you're as good as dead to me, and I want to get out of here, and I'm not going to get what I want anyway, and it looks like he is the ultimate statement of freedom And yet you find as he goes through the story that he's really, really caught. He's a captive. He's captive to discontent and to lust. There there was nothing more he wanted than to get out of town. I I think he'd had that story in his head that this is a dead end for me. There's nothing to do here. There's no excitement. There's no fun. This isn't life. And so it says he took what his father had given him and he set off for a distant country, got on the road out of town, and then it says he squandered his wealth in wild living. Later, his brother accuses him of spending his money on prostitutes and alcohol, and you kind of, it doesn't take much to realize that, that this younger brother is living the high life, at least for a little while. But he's really captive to the discontent in his own heart, and he's really captive, honestly, to the fact that he lives out his lusts, and the more you try to satisfy lust, the less satisfied you are. You can't drink enough to finally say, that's that's good, I'm done. You you can't have enough parties to say, okay, I don't need any more. 
because the more you have, the more it creates in you a discontent and a desire for more. And so he lives this, this wild living, and I don't know how long it lasted. I don't know how long his money lasted. And you know what's interesting about friends that you get in the high life? The, the people that are there when you got all kinds of money and you're providing the party, and then when the money's gone, somehow those friends are gone. They're like rented friends. They're, they're not real. And so he's captive to this this idea of his culture, evidently, that, that life was found in parties, and we find that extremely common in our culture, that life is found in experiences, whether they're just wild parties or just having great experiences. But, but this lust for more and this desire leads eventually, in his life, to not only cheap friends, but finally failure. So the story goes on, it says, after he had spent everything, I don't know how long that took, but there was a point at which he ran to the end of that, of that kind of living. And it says there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. And so he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. And he longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. You see, for a Jewish boy... The association with pigs was an unclean animal and uh, to be there caring for the pigs was like the lowliest servant's job and he's in such bad case that he's envious of the pigs. He wishes he could eat what they're eating and so he's captive to his own foolish decisions. He's captive to the the failures of the things he's chosen and, and he's made all these bad decisions and you know what we really want? We want to make bad decisions and have them turn out good and that doesn't happen. And so he's now captive to the choices he's made. And then it says, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he's also captive to shame. He, he finally comes to realize what he's done, and he's He's looking at his own choices and he's looking at, at what he left behind. He sees it far differently now. Instead of being the very place he wanted to get out of town, he, he now says, man, even my hired, the hired servants of my dad are, are doing better than I am. But he says, I'm not worthy. He, the good thing he says is he realizes he's captive to sin. I've failed. I've done what's wrong against, against God and against my dad but he's also captive to shame and feeling like he's worthless and like he doesn't deserve to be a son anymore. And so you see somebody who has been captive for so many years. They've gone through this cycle that has finally led them to a place of desperation. And in that desperation, the good news is he comes to the father and says, so he got up and went to his father. That's where the story begins to change. And while he was still a long way off, His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him and he ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him and the son (laughs) had his his speech already. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. The father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it and let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and he's alive again. He was lost and he's found. And so they began to celebrate. And you see the son, the son came home dragging his chains with him. He was caught in his failure and his shame and probably still in his belief that life somehow was passing him by. And, and I love this picture that it says the father ran to him. And there's a few Christian songs that celebrate that. But the idea that the patriarch of the family, the, the, fa- the, the father that had all this dignity, we don't run. That, that's undignified. That's, that's showing too much emotion. And so the, this simple statement in the, to the Jewish understanding would have been, wow, that father was really moved. He cared deeply. And he ran. And it says he threw his robe around him. Now think about it. Where's this kid been? Well, first of all, he's been traveling barefoot on a dusty road, so he stinks and he's dirty. But before that, he was hanging out with pigs. 
So he stinks, he's dirty, he's sweaty, there's nothing attractive about him. And I love this picture. The father puts the robe over and he covers all of that shame and all of that ugliness. And then he, he takes a ring to the son who says, I'm worthless, I'm not worthy to be your son. And he gives him the ring. And it, in their culture, this is more than, more than just jewelry. The signet ring that has the symbol of the family crest says, I belong. In fact, I can make decisions and I can stamp the ring into the clay and they are, they are then carrying all the authority of the father. Then it says he put shoes on his feet. I, I don't know how far he walked barefoot, but he was desperately in need and he's taking care of his needs. And I thought, what a picture of the father. He first of all covers his shame. He gives him an identity again as a son, and then he helps meet those needs. You know, the son totally deserved to be barefoot, deserved to have all the, the problems that he got because he made all these bad choices. But instead of the father saying it's about time or, or adding to his shame, he just said, you're my son, and you were dead, and now you're alive again. And my response is to celebrate. And I don't know if that relates to you. You see, I think the older brother was captive as well, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. But I want to pause right here and just say, if you're captive, if you're captive to the belief that all it takes is one more party for your life to be good, or one more good job, or one more promotion, or one more fancy car, or one more vacation, that God would like to free you from your captiveness to discontent and to lust. If you have made bad choices and you've caught in addictions, Jesus would like to come and run to you and to, to give you freedom from that captivity. If you feel like a failure, and maybe you've made some bad choices and there's every re reason to believe that you're failing, but God doesn't see you as a failure. And he came and he humbled himself and he said, I have failed, I have sinned. He's confessing his sin. And God comes to him and he covers him and he gives him identity. And perhaps you're feeling a lot of shame. You're ostracized. You're alienated from friends and family. You feel cut off and alone. And that same father, he runs to us. And he sent Jesus. And Jesus came to give his life, but also to tell stories about what the father is like. And then he surrendered his life to be crucified on the cross. And then he rose again the next day so that our sin could be forgiven and covered. And more than just a filthy uh, clothes that are covered by a beautiful, beautiful robe, he washes us clean and he pays for those sins and he takes them away. And so we're going to take just a moment and we're going to celebrate. We're going to take some elements that remind us that Jesus came and it was his body that was cruelly broken and beaten and his, his physical body was torn apart. But even more than that, he took on a, himself our sins so that all of the ugly decisions that we've made, all of the ways that we've run away from the Father and disrespected him, those can be completely washed away and covered. And that the juice is a representation of the blood of Jesus. And interestingly enough, it was a part of the the Jewish celebration of the Passover where God had set the children of Israel free from the bondage that they had been in slavery literally for 400 years. And that same Passover juice that signified the blood that they put over the doors of their house when the death angel passed over, Jesus took and he said, this is the blood of the covenant. And now I'm making a new agreement with you. And then that very weekend, he was crucified and his blood was spilled and his body was broken. So I'd like to pray together and then I'd like us just to eat and drink in the name of Jesus, confessing sin, if that's something that has come up as we've been talking through this, you just know that you need to say, Father, I've sinned, please again, wash me clean. And then we'll eat and drink together as we listen to a, a beautiful song that focuses on God's goodness to us and focuses on, it's called Run to the Father. And it talks about the response of that son when he saw the father running to him, he ran to the father and that we can always come to God no matter what's going on in our lives. 
So let's pray together and then we'll eat together and drink together as we listen to this song. Father, thank you that you see us as we are, even if we don't even know that we're captives, that God, you come and you set us free and you put a robe of righteousness over us to cover our filthy rags. Then you give us a ring of identity to say that we now are sons and daughters of the King. And you meet the needs that we have created by our own bad choices. And thank you, Father, for the, the gift of Jesus and the gift of life and the gift of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's celebrate communion together, shall we? Listen to this song. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation to let it all go. I see you now, I'm laying it down, and I know that I need you. I run to the fire, fall in a grace, I'm done with hiding, the reason away. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I run to the fire.
hope that was meaningful to you as you listened to that song and thought of your own relationship with God the Father. And that's perhaps the most famous part of the story. But really, Jesus was aiming this story at another group of people. And in, in fact, I told you that this could be called the tale of two captive sons. Because while the father has welcomed the younger son, the, the son who clearly blew it and knows that he's failed, there's another brother that comes into the picture. And I'm going to start reading in verse 22. So the father says, Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older brother was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and said, What's going on? Your brother's come, he replied, and your father's killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. And the older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. And he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you. Catch that word. And never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. This older brother, he's caught in the good life. The younger brother was living the high life. And when the consequences came, he was living the low life. This brother's living the good life. He stayed home. He, he did what his father had told him to do. But do you get his attitude? He says, all these years I've slaved for you. You see, the older brother, he was also caught. He was also a captive. And he was captive to a self-righteousness. He thought he could be a good person because he did the things that were supposed to be done. He was caught in a moralism that says, I'm good because of the things that I do and the things that I don't do. That, that being a good person means improving my moral score. And I know that that's exactly the reason some people come to church and avoid certain behaviors. Not out of a deep love relationship with the Father, but because I want to be a good person and I want people to see that I'm a good person and really, self-righteousness is a dangerous captivity because we don't see it. When, when the younger brother was envious of the pigs, he knew he was on the wrong path. When the older brother went to synagogue and did all the things that were right and honored his father and worked around the farm, he was captive in an invisible way. He was captive to his own self-righteousness. And when he saw the younger brother who had so clearly failed, when he saw him being loved and welcomed and, and the robe and the ring and the fatted calf. He was angry. He was, maybe the best word, judgmental. He said, that kid doesn't deserve that. You know what he did? He took your money, he squandered it with prostitutes. Why are you even talking to him? See, the danger of the self-righteousness is that I elevate myself above our other people. And I start keeping my own moral score, but I do it partly by comparing with other people's failings and their low moral scores. And that pride is so dangerous, it kills the spirit. And in fact, it says he doesn't go into the celebration. He won't even go into the house. And I want you to see those simple phrase that says, and the father went out to him. I don't know if you realize this, but the father went to the younger son who was clearly blown up his life. But the father also went out to the older son. And in fact, Jesus is telling this story to a group of religious leaders who are filled with their own self-righteousness. And in fact, they're trying to decide whether Jesus should even be a rabbi or not. And they're looking down on women and Samaritans and sinners and people who do tax collecting. And, and they see themselves as having the high moral ground and they're going to judge who else is good and deserves to be in their club. And the sad thing is that they're caught, that they're captives. And the father goes out and he says, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again, he was lost and is found. And Jesus in that story is making an appeal 
to those who live under religious obligation or moralism or judgmentalism. And he begins to say, you cannot find freedom. You cannot find salvation. You can't find life when you're so full of yourself. You see, the, the younger brother's bad decisions led him to desperation and that led him to confession. The older brother had it together. His life was successful. He looked good. He was probably well known in his community. He had, he had all the trappings of success except that his heart was hard and he didn't care about people and he, he honestly disrespected the father in exactly the same way. He, he didn't say, Dad, I love you and I've been doing this out of love for you. He said, I've been taking care of you and slaving for you all these years. And he didn't want to be with the father. He disrespected the father. And I think Jesus is aiming this story at those people who are caught in a religious picture of what is right and what is wrong and how bad everybody else is. And because of that, they're lost and they're captives. And the sad part of this story is that the younger brother who really blows it Clearly, he actually gets welcomed back into the family and has a party. And we don't know how this story ends. It's a parable, but it seems like the older brother goes off and stays in his hard-hearted condition. And I don't know how that relates to you. Maybe some of you, as we went through the younger son story, you thought, well, that's not me. I've never used drugs. I've never done this. I've never done that. But maybe you don't love lost people. Maybe you don't spend time with the father. Maybe, in fact, your picture of being good is a self-righteousness, not based on, I desperately need Jesus. And I I grew up in a good home. I was a pastor's kid, and I I had a lot more of the self-righteousness. I was more like the older brother. God had to work into my heart and to say, you know what? It took just as much of the blood of Jesus to save me as it did to save the worst sinner that there is. That at the foot of the cross, there's nothing but level ground. And that, in fact, there's a greater temptation not to confess and not to be broken and not to be concerned for people who are captive and, and in fact, to be judgmental of people who have failed. And so maybe that's a place where you are relating today. And you need to confess your sin. That maybe you went through communion and you thought, thank you, Lord, that I don't have all these other sins. And yet that sin of self-righteousness and pride and of looking down on others. In fact, I would say, More people don't come to church because of somebody who they know that already goes to church that they feel judged by and alienated from. And in this story, the question is, who do you most relate to? Who are you most like? And I would say probably my life has been a struggle with not being the older brother. But who I'd like to be like is the father who runs to the the ones who've blown their life up and who also appeals to those who have fulfilled all of their own righteousness because they both need set free. And Jesus has come to set the captives free, and he is a representative from the Father. So we're going to conclude this service right here with a song called Good, Good Father. And I want you just to think as you listen to it how good God has been to you. And if you need to let go of a judgmental attitude towards someone, of a, of a sense of your own self-righteousness. Just let that go and let yourself open your arms and run to the Father who has run to us. Let's listen to this together. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like but I've heard tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone your good good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm Just what we need before
Thank you for joining us this weekend, and I, I trust that that was a spiritually enriching uh, experience as we walked through the communion together. I told you this service was specifically for the online community, and uh, this announcement is for the online community. And I know that some of you are watching because this is a busy weekend, and uh, you were not able to come to one of our physical campuses. But during the pandemic, we have really realized that we needed to make a greater inv investment in, in our presence online. And as many churches, we've tried to step up our, our commitment to that. And because of that, there have been people who have joined us. You're watching some of you from all over the U.S., some of you from all over the world. And what's exciting to me as I look through the comments and see how it's all developed is, is some of you are not only starting to interact every weekend, but you're interacting with each other and you're beginning to invite other people to watch with you. And we really want to help make an investment in this online experience, this online community. And most of us are pretty busy. And so we want to help people find and follow Jesus, not just in Douglas County, but really all over in the places where we are connecting with you. And so we want to try to help make that experience more tangible, more real for you. And so we couldn't do that with the personnel we already had, so we have hired an online experience director, an online community director, and he is going to help set up Zoom time connection, uh, help one person who needs prayer get connected with somebody else who wants to pray for them. And out of that, we hope you will develop relationships, not only with us, but with each other. And so I want to introduce to you the one that we have chosen to take this position, and you've already seen him on the worship team, but his name is Austin Blanchfield. And why don't you just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and tell them a little bit about who you are and why you're excited about this. Yeah, definitely. So I am very excited because I'm passionate about really pursuing God, growing my relationship with the Lord. Um, I actually initially joined Family Church, as you saw uh, me playing worship, uh, being a part of the worship team because I really feel like uh, God has given me the gift of music. And so personally, I wanted to grow my relationship with the Lord through his gifts. And so that was through music. And during that time when I did join, I started to go through a lot of heart hardship. I kind of really relate to the prodigal son where I still started to seek, well, I really was seeking fulfillment um, in areas that was just dead ends. It, it wasn't truly... Uh, seeking the Lord. And uh, when I started to understand that, I ran to the Father. Mm -hmm. And the best way that I could have done that was seeking mentorship and guidance. And that was actually receiving discipleship from friends and mentors here, part of Family Church. And so they really guided me. They connected me to help me build my own relationship with Jesus. 
and really grow in that and experience his goodness. And because of that, I have a very, very strong passion for doing that. And so um, I've been in the online setting as an entrepreneur, just helping um, with group coaching and stuff like that. And so I really felt on my heart that God was uh, really, uh, as I grew closer to him, I was understanding his mission and I wanted to be on part, uh, on mission with him. And because of that, I wanted to really just be able to help uh, connect the online community in a way that's very engaging to where, you know, we aren't just consuming Jesus, but we're actually engaging with him and building a relationship with him. And so um, I'm very passionate and excited about this opportunity to help be on mission with God in a very unique way. So, Well, and Austin has done something else unique. He's a... Uh newly married, which is not that unique, but they did a whole online wedding experience, and uh, let me see how you respond online, and how, you know, this is kind of a new skill to help develop those community experiences that way, and so tell us a little bit about your wedding. Yeah, it was, it was really awesome. Uh, we had a lot of family, um, kind of all over the state, and because of COVID and certain restrictions, um, we, we just wanted to really be aware and understand where certain family members were at regarding COVID, and and so we wanted everyone to be, be involved and feel the love and feel the, have the experience of our wedding. And so we had it online, live streamed, and uh, created it to where it was engaging. Uh, so it was, it was really fun. It was, it was such a blessing being able to do that and have everyone involved and really feel connected as well. So, Yeah, and it didn't feel like, oh, it's leftover because we can't be in, here in person and we're, you know, this is kind of a substitute. It was really a delightful experience. And so we want to appeal to you if you would like to be part of helping us create this online community. Um, we need people who will pray, people who will connect with others, people that will maybe be involved in helping invite. We don't know exactly how that looks, but if you'd like to do that, your online connect card, you can just say, Austin, I'd like to know more about this or I would like to interact with you. And as you interact with Austin and with us as a church family, um, hopefully we can help you have that online experience where you have genuine spiritual relationships where you grow together and challenge each other and pray for each other and it becomes something that really moves you forward. So we're excited about this new venture and we hope you are as well. Let us know what you think. Uh, respond on Facebook or on your online connect card and let us know questions you have, uh, things you'd like to see, uh, ways in which you can help and we trust God's going to do great things with us. 